Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. Welcome, everyone, to this episode of the Into the Impossible podcast, a subset of the normal Into the Imagination podcast, a playlist, if you will, we're calling Nobel Minds. And it's fitting that the first entry in our Nobel Minds podcast series involves none other than Duncan Haldane, who was uh, not only a professor at one point when he did the work that led to his winning the Nobel Prize in 2016, uh, he was a Nobel Prize uh, aspirant and worked on the theory that led him to his Nobel Prize for topological matter and phase transitions while he was a professor at UC San Diego. And then we unfortunately lost him to our bitter rivals across the country in Princeton University. Uh, just kidding. We're very friendly with that fair university, <clears throat> which has more than its fair share of Nobel laureates. And Duncan Haldane's a, a very interesting guy. He came to UC San Diego in 2017 and recorded this interview. But I think it's sort of timeless and evergreen type message. And that we talked about what makes the process of creativity, especially in the realm of the quantum where he inhabits with his colleagues, and how that is so mysterious and, and but yet so captivating and perhaps so important. So in this episode, we discussed the difficulty in explaining what he calls quantum weirdness and the links that people, including the Nobel Committee, went to when they tried to describe his work, uh, along with um, with Alice and my former professor at Brown University, Michael Koskowitz, uh, when they won the Nobel Prize, the committee had to hold up you know, a set of bagels and pretzels and other kinds of weird buns and so forth. Uh, that uh, Duncan talked about during the lecture uh, that preceded this particular interview. Uh, what's remarkable about him is that he's, he's, uh, he's very mischievous in an intellectually uh, curious way. He has this uh, really devilish, delightful uh, ability to be playful and also uh, humble and mindful of his place in history. He actually plays a not small role in my book, Losing the Nobel Prize. He's actually featured in the book. Uh, there's a picture of him in the book, and we'll fold in a picture in the background. But he did, in fact, come to UCSD with a uh, real live uh, Nobel Prize back in 2017 when he was, um, uh, we were hosting him here on campus. And he had returned for the first time, perhaps, in decades. And I remarked, uh, as I do in the book, that he brought with him this prize. And afterwards, people were mobbing him and coming up to him and asking uh, for pictures, not with him, but with his Nobel Prize. And I'm holding it up and I say, um, and the author is holding the last Nobel Prize he may ever hold. It was the end of my hopes. And actually, he came to UCSD uh, as I was finishing up the first draft of my book, of Losing the Nobel Prize. And, uh, and I, even I succumb to this desire to want to bask in the glory of holding this gilded graven image shown behind me if you're watching the video. Uh, so uh, he's a delightful person. I always say, uh, you know, I don't fall, have any fault <laughs> against the Nobel Prize winners because the one rule that they uh, provided when I was <clears throat> asked to select the winners of the 2016 prize, spoiler alert, I did not choose Duncan, um, but, uh, but by other people, but nevertheless, the one rule that they still adhere to in Alfred Nobel's uh, will has largely gone out the window with the ways that they've modified it, as I described in the book. Uh, they, they adhere to it basically in two ways. They still want it to benefit mankind. And they also say that you can't choose yourself. You cannot, literally cannot nominate yourself to a Nobel Prize. So um, <clears throat> for those reasons, I think yeah, Duncan's a very special person. Um, and he, he and I sp speak in this episode, as you're about to hear, uh, see about, well, the value of basic scientific research, what he's doing, and whether or not it has a direct benefit to mankind, as Alfred Nobel stipulated in his will. And, the, and he makes a remark in the video that you'll see uh, that, you know, just as Maxwell could not have predicted the import and impact of his equations and could not have foreseen that they would be describing how an iPhone works, so too with a strange topological matter that they've 
uh, or rewarded the Nobel Prize for. So too, we may never know what the impact and import of that uh, discovery will be. And so uh, he really makes the case in this episode that the, the true arbiter of truth really comes down to uh, experimental verification, which is music to my ears as an experimental cosmologist. But that uh, that was really when the magnitude of his discovery truly hit him. And so it's a fascinating glimpse into the mind, the Nobel mind, as we call them, uh, on this playlist. And I hope you'll enjoy it, and I hope you'll uh, leave some comments uh, in, the, uh, in the box below. Thank you very much. Uh, and I thought we'd just start with a very brief introduction for our listeners as to uh, the, the occasion or the, the accomplishment for which you were awarded the Nobel Prize. I'll just read the citation. You won uh, uh, your Nobel Prize for your work in condensed matter physics, and you shared it with Michael Kosterlitz, who was my professor at Brown University a long time ago, and David Thalys for theoretical discoveries of topological phase transitions and topological phases of matter, especially in quantum systems confined to two-dimensional surfaces. So this is not something that's, you know, on the tip of everybody's tongue. Uh, is there any possible way, uh, we've, we've seen the contortions that the Nobel Committee went to to try to explain mm -hmm. uh, your work. Uh, I wonder, is that uh, fundamentally irreducible? As Feynman said, if I could explain it to you, it wouldn't be worth a Nobel Prize. Mm -hmm. uh, or can, can one actually explain it in a way that's comp as comprehensible as, as possible? Well, I don't know. I mean, thanks, Brian. Uh, I, I have a quote, which may be a misquote from Feynman, which says that if you can't explain the um, the Pauli exclusion principle or the spin statistic theorem to your grandmother, you don't understand it properly. <laughs> uh, she went to say, he did, which we don't understand. So I don't know. I mean, the, the quantum mechanics is this mysterious thing that uh, uh, physicists get by by, by just taking it taking it for granted and not worrying about it while the general, uh, philosophers and the general public kind of spend, find it incomprehensible. But it seems to be the way the, the universe works. It seems to be the way the world works. And um, the only way I've really come up, come up with ex explaining these things is that quantum mechanics can do really cooler things than we thought possible. Mm. And uh, so that's part of the excitement. This, this whole topological physics has been a, incredibly ins inspiring to, and, uh, to young people. In fact, you've got a whole lot of young people very interested in, in, in physics. It's because somehow a very powerful and clean idea like topology from mathematics turned out to allow one to, to think about uh, very constructively about these properties of quantum mechanics. And until this happened, topology was just not there in quantum mechanics. Let's take this piece by piece. What is topology? Topology is a branch of mathematics concerned with how properties of objects are preserved when they are stretched, deformed, or twisted. A circle is topologically the same as an oval, for example. It's a stretched circle. But all the possible positions of a hand on a clock are also equivalent to a circle, according to a topologist. Mathematically, topology is really, really good at describing three-dimensional surfaces. And Haldane, with the others he shared the Nobel with, pioneered some really hard math that worked really well when used to understand unusual phases or states of matter beyond the common three. The common three being gas, liquid, or solid. At really low temperatures, weird states occur, like superconductivity. That's when an electrical current can pass through an ultra-cooled material with zero resistance. That shift from plain matter to superconductive matter, and similar changes in state like superfluids, is something Haldane's work has been able to explain. And by being able to explain it, it has allowed scientists to begin to develop new materials that exhibit and exploit these properties. Perhaps even paving the way for things as far out there as quantum computers, something Haldane himself used to consider a pure science fiction fantasy. It seems to me that your discovery with your with your colleagues, um, you know, part of it it really uh, made physical a very abstract notion of topology, yeah. which is you know sort of the connectedness. I mean, you show these yeah. beautiful. Uh, uh, images of you know pretzels and of coffee cups yeah. and, and donuts and things like that that made me very hungry. Uh, um, but but in addition, these are these are 
purely mathematical concepts, yeah. which you reduce to a physical entity, to a notion that really is, you know, I always say to, to my students, I can't hand you a triangle. I can only hand you the notion. During the Nobel Prize ceremony, the presenter held up a bagel, a pretzel, and a cinnamon bun, and not because he wanted to highlight the variety of offerings at your local mall. Topology describes objects with set number of holes, and these are the only things a topologist really cares about, the number of holes. The bagel has one, the pretzel has two, and a cinnamon bun is holeless unless you pop out that rich, gooey part in the middle. The differences between the objects, cinnamon, pecans, flower composition, savory or sweet, are not important. But when a material switches between state to become a superconductor, it's like a bagel turning into a bun. There's a, a famous joke about this. So it starts, uh, you know, what is a topologist? And the answer is, someone who cannot distinguish between a donut and a coffee cup. Get it? Each one only has one hole. As you might guess, <laughs> quantum physics night at the comedy cellar is a little bit complicated. You know, jokes are seen in light of Schrodinger's cat, and they simultaneously kill and do not kill. The atmosphere gets very, very uncertain. For Hal Dane, the 2016 Nobel began back in the 1980s and involved a chain reaction of hints, discoveries, and new applications distributed between various so, colleagues yeah, so the, and universities. So I think everything has really come together through no one individual, but, but generally a, a recognition, something new showing up, and then when something new shows up, it takes a bit of time to put it in context. Mm -hmm. But all this stuff, the new things that showed up, and it turned out two things I contributed, I wouldn't have said they were connected in hmm. any obvious way. I didn't know the connection, and it only later with work of Shagan Wen, uh, who who set up a, 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 a systematic classification of of topological states, and it turns out the magnetic atom thing is in some sense the hydrogen atom, the, the simplest example of a of a topological state it's of entity. matter. Mm -hmm. You created much of the the, the work that, that led to the Nobel Prize you know, 30, 40 years ago. And yet and, and I remember hearing about it not just from my you know mm -hmm. my stat Mac professor Michael Kostelitz, but but I do remember, you know, hearing whispers that that you guys were gonna win the Nobel Prize and it was sort of a foregone conclusion. Uh, you know, A what you know what No, I don't think it was a foregone conclusion. I think this stuff was very interesting to theorists. Mm -hmm. it, it was a lot of you know it, it was controversial and the people at the theorists were interested. But I think what really made this uh, prize possible was the, the actual uh, development, probably by uh, Charlie Kane and Millie, that they, they took, they, they pushed my work in a way that I hadn't. I mean, I'd actually thought of pushing it in that direction too, but I never actually, it, I, I took a view that I didn't actually do the calculation. I thought about exactly the same generalization and uh but then i thought once you make it realistic it won't work and the amazing thing which actually charlie kane told me that they tested by doing a calculation i assumed what the calculation would be in advance of doing it and never did it so i assumed <laughs> there was no point in doing it because it wouldn't work right. charlie says they they anyway they didn't think they see why it would work but they put it on a computer and checked it out and they found there was a new principle of uh, involving um a fermion parity, which was not obvious, mm -hmm. and that led, and the fermion parity invariant, topological invariant, led to the three-dimensional case. And once again, it took work by others like uh, uh, Andre Bernavik and Xu Chen Zhang were kind of looking at this stuff, and, and the original models were again very not not very practical, and they didn't work out for graphene, but. These things require three three levels of things to come together. One is, I think that there's some deep underlying and abstract principles which are there to be found, but they're very difficult to understand and work with. I think the toy model intermediary that you can actually do a calculation fully, mm -hmm. see all the bits, how it all fits together, and, and maybe see something unexpected that you never understand why that works is it shouldn't really have worked but it did so to see that and then finally the third piece is for someone to actually make a con connection to to physical materials mm -hmm. and then the thing takes off you mm -hmm. actually to make a success you need these you need the underlying fundamental but probably difficult and abstract stuff which might be the mathematics in this case the principles 
the concrete calculation that really shows it up. Mm -hmm. And then the someone finding out how you actually make a real material. And of course, once real mat materials were found, then everyone was excited and was starting to search for them. And experimentalists, all experimentalists were showing movies of coffee cups right. changing into donuts and back <laughs> again. Right. right. <laughs> The Nobel Prize was originally framed as honoring science that provides the greatest benefit to mankind. When it's so hard for us humankind to understand the research that was honored by the prize, knowing where that benefit to humanity is can be difficult to see, which isn't to say it's not there. How, how do you see this creative process leading to the beneficence that Alfred Nobel envisioned to, to mankind? Well, uh, I think the... The deepening of the understanding of, of, of nature, especially quantum mechanics, is, uh, is a seed corn for all kinds of the future development of technology. And I think this century, I used to be you know, skeptical and think you know, that quantum computers were snake oil salesmen or snake oil. But uh, the seeing how when people start to, to actually get serious about looking at things, how much the improvements of the... You know the uh, how long how long coherence can be maintained and how these things improve and just the effect of of people getting excited about something and working on it and how much it advances. I think we will see some kind of uh, uh, quantum information technology of some kind emerge. It may not be you know breaking all our credit card codes or. I'm not sure what it will be, if what, what form it will take, and uh, you know it'd be difficult to predict what, you know, you know Maxwell wouldn't have predicted iPhones, right? <laughs> um, so, so I think uh, getting better understanding of of the fundamental principles of of how the world works is absolutely a benefit to mankind, Fantastic. Um, and it will actually historically it's always led. To to uh, to useful things that benefit the man in the street mm -hmm. or the woman in the street too, right? I mean, it's a very uh, it, it, it's a good it's I wouldn't bet against it. <laughs> yeah, very well. When we say it's difficult to see the benefit of research like this, we use seeing as a metaphor for knowing, a pretty common metaphor, and seeing is so integral to our ways of knowing going back into prehistory, arguably more so than hearing, touching, tasting, or smelling. Very arguably, but still. It's why the Nobel Committee swung by the bakery before their award ceremony to pick up a bagel, pretzel, and bun. Quantum physics and cosmology present special challenges for seeing what these theories propose and for knowing what they represent. These are the things which are the furthest away from our everyday experience on That's the human true. scale. Mm -hmm. Either on the very small or the very large, or they're all they're all weird, and so uh, of course we can't immediately, you know, get understand them by just looking around us. Uh, we of course need to look around us in very special ways for cosmology and for quantum mechanics. But, right. um, with uh, but yeah, so obviously if we're just kind of you know monkeys or something <laughs> around there, we'd be interested in bananas or whatever <laughs> it is. But these things are way beyond the issues of. Getting everyday enough, experience. getting an every day, getting enough bananas. Any sufficiently advanced technology is indistinguishable from magic. If you enjoyed this episode of Into the Impossible, please subscribe, comment, share, rate, and review. For a chance to win a free copy of our most recent guest's newest book, send a screenshot of your review to info at imagine.ucsd.edu. We appreciate hearing from you and are always open to your suggestions for future episodes. For more information, go to imagination.ucsd.edu. Find us on Twitter at ImagineUCSD. Watch us on YouTube, listen on iTunes. Into the Impossible is a production of the Arthur C. Clarke Center for Human Imagination in the Division of Physical Sciences at the University of California, San Diego. Eric Veery, Director. Brian Keating, Co-Director. Patrick Coleman, Associate Director. Produced by Stuart Valko.